Hi everyone, I'm Spiro with NewsBud. Today we are going to present an interview and the topic of discussion is Alexander Dugin. Mr. Dugin is a controversial Russian political figure. Dugin has been called the most dangerous philosopher in the world. His geopolitical vision is known as the Eurasian Union. What is Dugin's political philosophy? Well, according to Dugin, the three existing models are dead, and they are liberalism, both left and right, communism, including both Marxism and socialism, along with social democracy, and the third being fascism. So Alexander Dugin offers the fourth political theory. Alexander Dugin has been called the brain of Putin, as well as the Rasputin of Putin. Here to discuss the man behind the ideas is Newsbud researcher and analyst Ali Sayed, who is based in Belgium, and his guest, who is based in Germany, Wahid Azal. Azal is an independent scholar and political commentator. He also contributes for Counterpunch and Press TV. Mr. Azal recently wrote an article for Counterpunch titled Dugan's Occult Fascism and the Hijacking of Left Anti-Imperialism and Muslim Anti-Salafism. Gentlemen, take it away. Hello, Mr. Wahid. Nice to, uh, nice to be on your shirt today. Thank you very much. Um, I was very interested in, in, in digging into Dugan slightly more than what's been available in the media. And um, we hear a lot of things uh, of who the man is and... and, and what his goals are, or and it's very either it's it's an either or situation. Um, so either he's portrayed as a fascist or the savior of Russia. So <laughs> I, I would like to get a more nuanced view on the man himself and maybe his ideology and, and what drives him. And uh, I, I think you're ideally positioned to do so, as as also I think uh, you are the head of the a Sufi order in Germany. So I, th I think you will be more familiar with where he's coming from in the logical sense. Alexander Dugin. Is is a basically a product of the post-Soviet era. I mean, he his ideas were percolating basically during the last few years um, of the USSR. I mean, he came through uh, the Bohemian uh, swamp of, of Moscow and Saint Petersburg uh, in the 1980s, and quickly found himself within the far right and occultist scene simultaneously. For example, he became a member of uh, the Pamyat. Uh, party in the late 80s, um, which later it was revealed to be a KGB front. Now, Pamyat was a revival by ultranationalists of the Black Hundreds, which had been a uh, a kind of a white neo-fascist or fascist uh, paramilitary during the, the Russian Civil War. And um, Dugan found himself in these groups and he found himself in, in various occultist groups who were, you know, basically combining uh, Satanism and National Socialism together. Um, there's an element of farce to that period of his of his life, and I think you know we we should be fair to the man that he was you know he was young and impressionable, uh, but he got into a lot of trouble with the law and and, and the Soviet authorities at the time. Um, his father apparently was a, a high-ranking lieutenant colonel in the security establishment uh, at the time, and as a result of Dugin's uh, activism, anti-Soviet activism. Uh, was demoted from his job. Actually, they, they basically threw him out of the uh, out of that particular department of of, uh, of uh, Soviet security and posted them somewhere else. He had a falling out with his father apparently over this um, during the period as the Soviet Union is collapsing. The 1991 period, uh, Dugin made various contacts with the. New Right and uh, some of the neo-fascist groups in Western Europe, uh, particularly with uh, the, the circle of uh, Alain de Benoit in, in France, uh, who is the one of the most eminent New Right uh, figures in Europe and has been since the late 1960s. When the Soviet, when the Iron Curtain came down, when the Soviet Union finally imploded at the end of 1991, rather than rejoicing over the fact, like many of the nationalist dissidents of, of the former USSR, uh, Dugin found himself basically lamenting this uh, collapse of the USSR. And he, oh, wow. he was in, in the company of people like Lev Gumilev, who is actually the, 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 the theoretician of Eurasianism, a, an eminent academic dissident that was in and out of the Gulag system in the former USSR, who developed this very 
kooky idea of Eurasianism and almost neo-fascist ideas. Uh, and once the USSR went down, um, basically these very nationalist forces who had in many ways been instrumental for the collapse of, of the Soviet Union suddenly found themselves in the, the position that they wanted to revive it again. And that's when uh, Dugan basically started climbing through the ranks of the new Russian Federation system within uh, various political circles, both communist and nationalist circles. So he, he, he basically advocated for the fall of the Soviet ideology, but once, yes. it, was, once it was gone, he lamented it. Uh, was he lamenting the actual fall of the ideology or, or the condition the country was in, for example? The condition, I think with Dugan, it's more the case that he lamented that the condition the country was in, that the, you know, that, that the Red Empire or the Russian Empire in the red cloak had, had basically imploded. Uh, so there was more of a nationalist sentiment behind that. And, and it was pretty brutal. At the maybe time. loss of We're, territory as well and influence. So loss of territory, yeah, exactly. Could you just maybe explain for, for the people who may not be so uh, accustomed to all these terms uh, what actually Eura Eurasianism is? What actually is the, the whole concept behind Eurasianism? Well, the concept of Eurasianism, I mean, it's very difficult to pin down with Dugan because he kind of shifts back and forth between his definition. But as a basic concept, I mean, Eurasia as a geography or a topographical geography is the entire... Asian European landmass. So all of Asia, all of Europe is technically by topographies of ge books of geography, Eurasia. Now Eurasianism as an ideology, as the you know, as the theory that was formulated by Gumilev, um, is that you know Russia is kind of the heart of Eurasia. So that Russia, in a sense, uh, has a quote unquote, I hesitate to use this word, but it, it fits. Uh, a manifest destiny in this entire region. The geopolitical, geopolitical, the geopolitical heartland yes. of the region. I mean, it's yes. also treated as the heartland in many geopolitical theories. Yeah. It's interesting that you raise this because the whole concept of geopolitics is a uh, an idea that was um, basically presented in, in the early part of the 20th century by a British uh, political scientist by the name of Mackinder, who um, separated the world into the spheres of Eurasia and Atlantia, you know, the Eurasian uh, empire being the, you know, the, the empire of the land, Atlantia being the uh, empire of the sea. And um, Mackinder didn't really have that much influence during his own time on uh, British imperial policy. Dugan has latched on to some of Mackinder's ideas with those of Gumilev and formulated this very almost Manichaean uh, idea of the of the destiny of Russia or the Eurasian Empire that almost uh, comically harkens back to George Orwell's 1984 in many respects. It's it's you know this, one has to does wonder whether this is a, a joke on the part of Dugan because he's he's you know this is stuff that we read on in the pages of fiction and his idea of Eurasia is a very totalitarian uh, what he defines as a totalitarian ethno pluralist, which is not exactly multiculturalism. It's very equivocal reading Dugan. You know, you've got to really read him with a fine tooth. On the one hand, he says he rejects the whole notion of biological racism. So, you know, they, you know, he says that, you know, his fourth political theory has nothing to do with, you know, these crude racist ideas of the Nazis of the 1930s. And to get it straight, the fourth political theory and Eurasianism is kind of synonymous, right? Or am, yeah, am I right? It is. In the way that Dugan is formulating um, his theory of Eurasianism, they're synonymous now. Um, on the other hand, you know, Dugan has latched onto this very um, dubious theory that was put out by these new Reichers um, back in the 1970s called ethnopluralism. Now, ethnopluralism is kind of a way for um, more sophisticated intellectual fascists uh, to circumvent accusations of racism. So ethnopluralists, as advocated by the likes of people like uh, uh, the Binoa, is that, you know, they will... Um, champion the rights of minorities throughout the world and cultures and, and champion cultural diversity and champion the integrity of cultures around the world. But um, they reject, and you know, maybe rightfully so on, on some intellectual level, uh, this uh, attempt by liberalism or Western liberalism to create this kind of a melting pot of all cultures where everything becomes kind of a, a, a unifocal as such. But ethnopluralism doesn't, you know, by the same token, when it's championing, you know, cultural, the integrality of cultures will also uh, 
say things like, if, you know, that all people of other cultures should stay in their cultures, that, you know, cultures are like islands un unto themselves. How does Dugan view Western European culture as opposed to Eurasian culture? Are they, are they equal? Are they still others or are they part of the same group? Or So what is the criteria to be he, a Eurasian? He, he, no, no, this, this is the question. He equivocates quite a lot throughout his writing, not, not just in the fourth political theory. On the one hand, um, you know, the Slavic and Russian uh, definitions of, of Dugin seem to set the Slavic and the Russian people as a completely different species, right? But yet the theory of Eurasianism that, that, that Dugin inherited from people like Benoit and, and uh, Theriot, uh, po postulates that Russians and the Slavic people and all of the European people are one singular uh, unitary race. So it is culture. actually based on, on biology uh, in, in a way, is, is what I'm getting the impression. Anyway. Like I said, I mean, although there's a lot of equivocation in that respect, um, ultimately it does come down to that, yeah. Okay, so, so where does Eurasia end and where does Eurasianism end? So, so the actual Eurasian as a being, and because it seems to me that the whole of the world is Eurasia, but yeah, I mean, pretty this specific pretty, chosen category is 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 the Eurasians. For example, in his foundations of geopolitics, which um, only exists in summaries in English translation, it's what probably one of his scariest books ever written. Um, he will say that Eurasia is the entire Asian landmass, but then in in some of his later public publications, like this uh, publication of his in German. Um, he will exclude all of Asia, you know, whether it be China, Japan, Korea, and India, from that Eurasian definition. Um, usually, I mean, at the moment, the concept of Eurasia is the one that Theriot, uh, Jean Francois Theriot first proposed, which is basically from Vladivostok to Lisbon, horizontally, is Eurasia. And this is the working definition of Eurasia that Dugan is presently working with. Although previously, you know, Eurasia also included uh, all of Asia, you know, I mean, he was, for example, in the foundation of geopolitics, he advocates for Russia to dismember China and for Russia to then take over Mongolia, Tibet and Manchuria as part of its Eurasian empire. Uh, one, one aspect of this I, had, uh, I was interested in is um, while researching some of this orthodox ideology uh, I realized that one of their goals, because of the the group he belongs to, is the old old Russians. The old believers, yeah. The old believers. So he's coming from a very traditional, separate kind of sect or cult, you could call it, of Orthodox Christianity. Uh, I, I read that they were actually encouraged to go to general Orthodox Christian church, but they maintained a kind of a separation between them and, and the general masses of Orthodox Christians. While researching, I came across that one of their main goals is to actually reconquer Constantinople, as, as, and yes. obviously Hagia Sophia. My question is, how are the Turks okay with this? It needs to be pointed out that uh, Dugin, Alexander Dugin was actually in Ankara uh, during the coup in July last year. And he was meeting with the Perinchek party of, uh, known as the Vatan Partisi, Apparently, um, he was sent by, by Putin himself, or this is the rumor, there's no way to prove this, um, to kind of smooth out the talks that were going on between uh, the Kremlin and Ankara at the time. And this is when the coup happened, which, you know, makes me somewhat question what really happened there uh, last July. You know, it's, it's very mysterious. Yeah. It's very mysterious for this guy to be there at the very time this, this, this all unfolded. The Duganists and his Eurasian philosophy, they're very upfront, at least in Russia, uh, that their ultimate aim is to take back Constantinople uh, for Christianity. You know, the, the TV station that he is uh, now the lead anchor for is called Zagreb. And Zagreb is the old uh, Slavonic or Slavic name for Constantinople. So are, they, are they literally talking about invading Turkey and taking back Hagia Sophia, or 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 would would the fact that maybe uh, the president of Turkey would 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 reconvert <laughs> The church, which was wrongfully converted into a mosque in the first place, or are they literally talking about like a physical uh, invasion of, of a different country? Well, Is they it? have never actually said it in those terms, but you know, since I mean, one needs to put two and two together. Since Dugan believes in all-out ap apocalyptic global war, and that you know, one of the aims of, of, of the Eurasian philosophy is to take back Constantinople eventually. That means that eventually Dugan foresees a time where you know Russia would invade Turkey and take Constantinople. By first, which then raises the question, why do we have all these left-wing as well as far-right parties in Turkey 
making alliances with, with the Duganists. This makes absolutely no sense. Now, it doesn't make sense from the geopolitical point of view immediately, but it makes sense, at least from the point of view of Dugan, of this occult praxis uh, that they are implementing, you know, in weakening all sides, by playing all sides against each other in various alliances to ultimately make this happen. So my view is that, you know, the, the presence of Dugin and even Russia in the Middle East, while it's good in the sense that they're helping the Syrians fight off these Takfiri hordes, um, is not a very good thing uh, for the long term. And there's many reasons for this. One of which, which I should mention about uh, Dugin's biography, is that Dugin has maintained long-standing connections to Zionists, hardcore Zionists. Um, he's, open, he's openly anti-Zionist. Uh, I mean, that's, 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 this is that's what, what he I'm... says. This is what he says. Uh, Dugin, one of Dugin's closest friends uh, of 20 years, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Avigdor Eskin. Eskin uh, is a Russian emigrate to Israel, an Israeli citizen, far right, uh, supporter of Kahanist uh, philosophy. So this is as far right in Israeli politics as you can get. And uh, Eskin was uh, made notorious over the fact that he participated in this ritual cu curse of Yitzhak Rabin, uh, this ritual Kabbalistic curse in 1995 that within 30 days uh, saw the assassination of Rabin. Um, so the, you're, you're talking about some really nasty players. Good friends with that. He's also known to uh, have uh, indirect connections to the Chabad movement, the Lubavitchers. And, you know, from one point of view, this makes no sense. You know, if these people are fascists and they're espousing anti-Semitism amongst their own people, how could these Zionists make, you know, these connections with these people? Well, this seems to be a praxis that is happening currently with... Uh, a lot of the right wing, uh, you know, the right wing side of Zionism, that they are making common cause with these factors around the world. It's very strange also that, that he was actually thrown out of the Moscow University for for inciting um, for inciting people to kill actually in, in the Donbass area in Ukraine. Yeah, the Ukrainians, yeah. But, but yeah. the more I read on, the more he's connected to... to to the people in Donbass itself that are fighting the, the, the Russians. So it, it's like he has tentacles on both sides, and, and I don't that's, get it. That's part of the occult praxis. That is part of the, that is part of the occult praxis. He's, he's literally supporting people, the Nazis in Donbass, which we, everyone knows they're Nazis. I mean, it's not a, a secret or anything, um, <coughs> fighting the Russians uh, in Ukraine. And then he's also supporting, he was literally thrown out of the Moscow University for inciting people to kill, kill the, he actually said, kill, kill, kill. This goes back even to his days um, as a member of Pamyat in the 1980s. Dugan was actually expelled from Pamyat because of accusations of being a pro-Zionist. Yeah, this was the ultra-nationalist, totally anti-Semitic uh, group that now we know was a uh, uh, front for the KGB at the time. But he's infiltrated. He, yeah. So he will say, you know, he will spout anti-Semitic rhetoric amongst one group of people. But then he maintains close contacts with the likes of Eskin and Chabad and some of these really nasty settler Zionist types. Uh, you gave me a link last night to, to a book. I kind of read the beginnings of it. Um, it really went into how he started um, and, and the circles he began with. And it, it seemed very occult. And uh, that's yeah. the angle I want to get into because your, your article in Counterpunch uh, was also based on on, on, on his occult beliefs. Um, could you speak more about that? Certainly. I think it's, very, um, it's, very, it's a very uh, juicy subject. Like, I want to know, is he a Satanist? Or like people are saying that he's an occultist? Or, or is he a magician? Or, or what, 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 what is going on? Or is, or is it just rumors? No, no. I, my belief is that Alexander Dugan is a, he's a Satanist. And he's using Orthodox Christianity as kind of a, a, a platform to mask his real beliefs and intentions. And, and you mean uh, like Satanists like Aleister Crowley or... Yeah, or the they, they call, occult okay. Satanism. Yeah, occult Satanism. And this is coming from the angle of what in Western occultist milieus are called the left-hand path. But with Alexander Dugan, I mean, if, for example, in his fourth political theory, there's a very controversial appendix at the end of the book, which is basically the guiding thesis of, of the whole book, but he's made it only an appendix, and it's called The Metaphysics of Chaos where he, he argues um, using Heideggerian language, uh, philosophical language of, of, of phenomenology, uh, that, that 
chaos in this new age, this epoch dawning, um, is basically displacing the logos. Now, put into theological language, that is like making the claim that Satan is now displacing God as the master of the universe. Um, and this is very problematic uh, for any uh, person of, of, of the Abrahamic tradition. And for Dugan to be speaking to this uh, is, is, is quite troubling. And th but this also echoes uh, the kind of belief systems of, of, of you know, the Crowleyan uh, Thelema, um, you know, the, the aeon of the child, and Alistair Crowley, you know, proclaiming himself to be the, the messiah of this era. And, and this is all uh, quite troubling, troubling stuff. The book itself, you know, when one reads it quite carefully, it's very, uh, there's lots of contradictions and paradoxes in this book. It's, it's, uh, it's more like, you know, philosophical poetry that really uh, is taking ideas from everywhere, mainly from uh, a lot of national socialists and fascist thinkers of the last centuries and basically throw them, throwing them all together in the soup. Uh, but that, that appendix, which incidentally in its Persian translation, its Farsi translation, has been omitted completely uh, from that, uh, from it. And, and I find that very suspicious because I came across this fact as well that his, uh, his, his narrative is kind of aimed at specific audiences and it's tweaked as such to, to get maximum appeal from that audience. So for example, I, uh, I came across his uh, a YouTube channel uh, explaining his Serb Serbian translation of the fourth political theory, and it had additions in it which uh, were Serbian specific and appealing to the the Serbian nationalistic tendencies and feelings. Um, it, it was very a lot to do with death and the occult as well. So it, yeah, it was kind of, yeah. I was a bit shocked by it as well that uh, they viewed death as as kind of a, a goal even in itself. But this is very Heideggerian, and this is this is this is uh, where one has to be very careful with Dugan. I mean, uh, Heidegger's entire philosophy of being, his his uh, ontology, is really a philosophy of being to death. Whereas you know the transcendental philosophies of other existentialists from traditional civilizations, like for example Iran or you know even the East, India, is a being beyond death. You know that the being of man is just a transitory state within this material world, and then it, it progresses through multiple worlds. If you believe in reincarnation, it comes back again. But with Heidegger, you know, being or Dasein, being there, um, is basically defined as, as the material being of an individual in the spatio-temporal world of matter, and then it ends. So you always have this angst of death. So it is basically the human condition is a constant situation of being to death. And uh, this is this is how one needs to contextualize uh, Dugan's fascination with with you know all of this stuff. Okay, uh, can we shift to a more uh, geopolitical area of discussion? Sure. Um, uh, his concept of Eurasianism as as a geopolitical entity coming from the heartland of of, of the main continent. Um, how is it possible for someone to promote this concept while promoting the the concept of Western unions to dissolve actually? So it, doesn't this look kind of uh, contradictory where he's either for unions or he's against unions or he's for his own union but doesn't want competitive unions? Mm -hmm. That for me is one of the main points of contention. Well, when one understands that the basic thrust, the base, the end goal of Eurasianism is to is for a Russian empire and that okay. there are statements. The return of that, the, so the return of a Soviet Union without the Soviet ideology, is, is, is that what you're saying? Return of the, so return of the Soviet bigger. Union are bigger, you know, basically, I mean, you know, from, from Vladivostok to Lisbon. I mean, that's but the basic... I, I don't really see anything premise. wrong with that, in the sense that I, I consider everyone who, who's had an empirical past to, to want to hearken back to that era. For example, like Erdogan want, wanting to recreate the, the, the Sultanate, or, or Iran wanting to increase its sphere and influence back to what its imperial days were like. Or the, or the same with the British, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese. So, is there intri something intrinsically wrong with that motivation, or, or is it just the way he's going about it? I think the devil is in the details. Look, you know, the basic premise of multipolarism is a good idea that I don't think, I, I think very few people would, would disagree with, right? Um, you know, the failure of this unipolar neoliberal world order, I mean, it is a good thing that it is just failing. Um, however, what 
that Eurasianism represents is a sort of New World Order 2.0, um, wow. where you have a multipolarism, but this multipolarism is dominated by Russia completely around the globe. So it, it's it's sort of a recreation of the unipolarism that we have right now, but with you know with the accoutrements and the embellishes of a of a Russian, a totalitarian Russian uh, dominance. And this is where you know I don't quite comprehend how China is actually going along with all of this, given uh, Dugan's quite explicit anti sino uh, views that, that, he, that he wrote about in, in the Foundations of Geopolitics. I mean, he wants to dismember China completely. And this is the, what, what the, these new rightists, uh, neo-fascists, call the metapolitics. Their metapolitics is to dominate through the culture, you know, that they will seize power through culture. And, you know, they're doing this quite successfully at the moment through the Internet. Very popular um, in, in anti-interventionist circles, but even in anarchic circles, he's popular. Um, yeah. And, and he's also, um, I, I think he's, cre he's created a big network in Europe, and a lot of people here are worried about upcoming elections, and a lot of the po politicians, I don't think they will openly say it, um, that they're having an ideological battle with Dugan. But, I mean, you go into the hacking rumors and all of these things coming across, but I think the battle is being waged in, in, in these arguments and, and uh, philosophies clashing with each other. And I think Dugan's getting the upper hand here because yeah, I, I would have to say there's a mass appeal to what he's saying. And even, even I am kind of attracted to it in, in that sense. Uh, and that is why people need to look at these ideas very critically. I mean, I don't I don't tell people to, I don't dispel people from reading his books or looking at his videos. They should. I think people need to understand where he's coming from. But you need to look at the whole Dugan. You need to look at Dugan who says one thing to one group of people and another thing to another group of people. Um, you need to read Dugan of not just the text of the fourth political theory. You also need to then balance that with the, that final appendix of the book. You need to look at Dugan uh, the, the national socialist Satanist of the 1980s in, in quite a, some of the dubious bohemian circles that he was hanging out with. All of these things need to be taken on board. You need to look at the Dugan that, that cultivated the alt-right in the United States. I mean, this Richard Spencer, uh, his ex-wife now, uh, Nina Kupriganova, um, is one of the most eminent Duganists in North America. She, she's the translator of the fourth political theory. What is your opinion on, on the Dugan effect, if you can call it that, in the upcoming elections in Europe? The Dugan effect flopped in Austria, thank God. Um, so that election went to the Greens. Um, it flopped in, in the Netherlands, in Holland. Um, my jury is still out on France, but I am hoping that, uh, that the, the Front National doesn't make it in. Um, there are indications that the polls are moving up and down, so we can probably see anything. But if Marine Le Pen makes it, Elsie Palace, she will have to hold, uh, uh, Mr. Alexander Dugan the, the election to the pres French presidency. And it's no secret that she's funded, uh, openly funded by Russia. I mean, she doesn't deny it. I mean, I would love to expand more on, on, on his occult angle a bit is it is it is it actually proven that he's an occultist or, and what are the what are the best arguments it's, that he is i mean i've read his history and you can chalk it down to uh you don't you don't need to you don't even need to know what he's doing look at his eurasian flag that is the chaos sphere that is the symbol of chaos magic yeah oh, the, really? the, with the yes. eight arms still? okay okay yeah so the, yeah. the symbology is already pointing towards yeah. that direction. It's a cult already. Yeah, this is the and, symbol and, of and chaos. Then, then the contradiction and, and chaos in itself, where he's holding one position on one side, he's literally advocating for for the takeover of Constantinople, whilst helping Turkey and Erdogan at the same, or supposedly yeah. helping Erdogan. At the and same let, time. let's not forget his his uh, primary primary uh, theoretical text, the fourth political theory. The the, but he's, the, he's the even. yeah the yeah the book. Uh, that appendix is called, appendix is called the metaphysics of chaos, where Dugan is advocating for you know the the, the you know the supplanting of logos by chaos. So basically, the devil overthrows God and sits in his place. 
in theological language. That's basically. And, and, I, and I, that's why one of the reasons I contacted you. Because, contacted you. Because, thank you, uh, Mr. Wahid Azal, for taking the time to join us here at Newsblood and offering this very unique perspective on a very complex character that is Mr. Dugan. Um, also, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite Mr. Dugan himself to maybe comment on what was said today and to offer maybe a fuller picture or the other side of the story. Thank you very much. Uh, reporting from Newsblood, this is Ali Sayed. We would like to thank Ali Sayed and his guest, Wahid Azal, for this very interesting discussion. Now, you can find Wahid's work on Counterpunch and Press TV, and we'll also provide a link for his blog below. Be sure to visit newsbud.com and become a member where you'll get access to exclusive content. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. For newsbud.com, I'm Spiro. For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the Newsbud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from NewsBud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from NewsBud's founder, Sibel Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at NewsBud.com.